friends, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I've got to be quite careful, because the one thing of which I've always been very proud is that Rotary is a completely non-party political organisation. And it just so happens that we're in day 13 of the general election. And all I will just say is today is the deadline when you can register to vote on the 8th of June. And tomorrow is the deadline for applying for a postal vote. There you are. Wasn't that non-political? <laughs> now, let me face up to the title of what um, I'm to speak about, which is whether Brexit. <clears throat> now, those of you who know me reasonably well know that I am a convinced and passionate European. And um, I found myself in complete tune with the uh, editor, the new editor of the Evening Standard, <laughs> who in his first editorial, uh, just a matter of days ago, in the Evening Standard, uh, when he wrote in the editorial, this paper is committed to freedom and optimism. He said this, the British people were asked last year whether we should remain in or leave the European Union. Although the majority of Londoners wanted to remain, the country, by a clear but small margin, voted to leave. This paper respects that democratic decision, even though it continues to believe it to have been a historic mistake. And I think there we have it. So what can I say about Brexit? And I really love just to leave it to you to decide which aspect of a very complicated scene you'd like to ask a particular question or express a view about. But let me just start off with first Article 50. Now I know the history of Article 50 because I was on the select committee of the House of Lords that investigated into how it came about. And Jack Straw, who was a Foreign Secretary in the Labour government, he came and explained it in private to us, but it's now public knowledge, that the Article 50 became part of the Treaty of Lisbon, not because the European Union wanted to give the opportunity to anybody to leave, but because at the time the European Union was deciding whether or not to adopt a constitution of the European Union. And there was a vigorous debate, not only about a new code of human rights, also a whole range of other issues. And up piped Denmark. I don't know whether there are any Danes here. But Denmark said, I'm very sorry, but the people of Denmark will never sign up to a, a an overriding constitution in the European Union. So everybody gasped, and immediately a rushed draft was circulated, which eventually became Article 50, to say that it would be perfectly possible for any country to withdraw should they wish to do so at any stage. Then, of course, the whole debate moved on. And the European Union decided not to pursue the idea of a constitution. But for some reason, Article 50 remained in the combined Treaty of Lisbon. And that is now, of course, to most people, the trigger mechanism for leaving the European Union. But it's much more than that. And the one point I just wanted to get across to everyone is that Article 50, although the President of the Commission doesn't seem to have realized this, gives any country the legal right, the legal right to withdraw and give two years notice, and at the end of the two years, there's no penalty, there's no debt, there's nothing at all. Which is why our select committee in the House of Lords decided that actually 
We don't have any debt at all at the end of the two-year period. There are no obligations because of Article 50. The second point I was just going to say is that Article 50 not only gives the trigger mechanism which enabled the Prime Minister to activate notification on the 29th of March last, it not only gives you the opportunity to give notice to withdraw, it also sets out the way in which the proceedings will then take place. And I just quote the bit that seems to have escaped the notice of Jean-Claude, um, which says, a member state which decides to withdraw shall notify the European Council of its intention. The Union shall then negotiate and conclude an agreement with that state setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, and then these key words, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. So therefore, not only does a country have the legal right to withdraw, but it also has the legal right to talk about its future trading relationship with the Union, at the same time as these negotiations are taking place. And this is probably why you're starting to hear all the political parties, with one exception, but the two main political parties are laying down the sort of procedure that will be followed once the general election takes place. And if I can just go through what's going to happen after the 8th of June, we should know the decision on Friday the 9th of June. On Saturday the 10th of June, the new Prime Minister will form their government, first their cabinet, and then probably on Monday the 12th of June, uh, all, their, all the ministers will be announced. And on the 13th of June, we return. And there is a royal commission to which uh, those of us in the House of Lords <coughs> respond and go to sit in the chamber, and all the MPs cruise in from all parts of the country and stand at the bar and are then told to go away and elect their speaker. <coughs> then the following day, they will come back and announce their speaker. And then the following Monday, the 19th of June, we will have the Queen's speech and we'll start the new session. And pretty soon after that, uh, our new Prime Minister, if it is, I have to be careful because there is a Prime Minister at the moment, but she's subject to re-election. Have I been non-political enough? <laughs> I hope I have. Um, uh, whoever is elected Prime Minister will then start the negotiations. And I thought before I sit down, I just refer to the guidelines which the European Council, the European Parliament, and um, the Commission have now agreed. The core principles, number one, is that whatever happens, the UK will be a close partner in the future. Item number two, any agreement with the UK will be based on balance of rights and obligations and will ensure a level playing field. It's fascinating. Thirdly, preserving the integrity of the single market excludes participation based on a sector-by-sector -sector approach. So the European Union doesn't want um, people picking bits where there should be a single market and bits where there shouldn't be. And the four freedoms are indivisible, as we all know, they include the free, free movement of people. And the Union's overall objective will be to preserve its interests, those of member states, citizens, and businesses with a phased approach, giving priority to orderly withdrawal. Now, there are just two minor points I'll mention. You may wonder why it is that money is so dominant in the discussions and the noises that have been taking place in Brussels and in each country. It is almost as if the only thing uh, some people involved uh, think about is money. Well, there's a clear reason for that, and that is that the UK is the second largest contributor to the funding 
of the European Union. It's a massive amount. And if you look at the figures, Germany is the largest net contributor at 17 billion. We are the next at 14 billion. And then the next one is 7 billion. So you will see immediately that our money is absolutely key uh, in any discussions. And our contribution is equivalent to the amount received by 15 of the recipient countries. So there are a number, the largest by the way is Luxembourg. Um, they receive, they receive 2,278 pounds per head uh, from the uh, contribution of the UK. I think the next is Slovakia 560, the Czech Republic 525. If you total up all the recipients of money from the European Union, that's equivalent, the 15 recipients are equivalent to our contribution into the European Union. And my final, final, final point is I think there's some fascinating figures. When you look at the other major issue which is spoken about in Brussels is the number of European citizens present in the UK and the number of UK citizens present in the rest of Europe. And if you look at the number of British citizens living in the European Union, they're pretty evenly spread with the majority in Spain, France, Ireland and Germany, but all distributed apart from Lithuania, where there are 231, and it's said that the police in Lithuania know the identity of each one. But no, no, I never said that. But the balance is incredible. Being a Liverpudlian, I had always felt that there were more Irish citizens in the UK than any other European. Well, there aren't. If you total up all the British citizens living in the European Union, you put together the total, it's about 700,000. There is one country whose number of citizens living in the UK exceeds 700,000, and it is Poland. <laughs> there are 916,000 uh, Polish citizens living in the UK, and I have to tell you, we would be much poorer if they weren't here. Yeah. Certainly my local farmer wouldn't know what to do, but also they contribute hugely. And I just hope that one of the things in wither Brexit that I hope will happen is that we'll reach an early decision guaranteeing the rights of EU citizens here in the UK equally guaranteeing the rights of our citizens living in the rest of Europe. Thank you.